In 2013, a company in the UK hired a brand new CEO. Within two years, 85% of the employees at this company had quit their jobs. Six months later, so about two and a half years after this guy was hired, that turnover rate had increased to over 100%. So the entire original batch of employees had quit. And then additional employees that had been hired since had also quit their jobs when they realized how toxic this workplace had become. How does a CEO nosedive a company this hard over just two or three years? It turns out that CEO that was hired was a psychopath. Now, the reason we know this is that the CEO and the company I mentioned were the primary focus of a case study that was published in 2015. Now, those researchers used an, an inventory called the PMMRV2. It's a, a, a series of questions that's meant to establish high versus low levels of psychopathic tendencies in an individual. Specifically, it's meant to measure management and leadership figures within a company. This guy, this brand new CEO, scored a perfect score, 10 out of 10, the highest possible score on this scale of psychopathy. And he ran the company the way you might expect. Employees reported that he ruled through fear and intimidation. He was underqualified, wasn't very organized. And effectively, he, he destroyed the company. I like this example because it flies in the face of a couple common misconceptions about psychopaths. Number one, I think a lot of people think of psychopaths as, as being serial killers, which is, there is a lot of overlap there for sure. Um, there's a disproportionate amount of psychopaths in, in the prison population, for example, compared to the general population. But a lot of psychopaths are not in prison. A lot of psychopaths function. They have nine to five jobs. They might work with you. There are statistically psychopaths in every profession. Uber drivers, chefs, musicians, lawyers. The other misconception is that CEOs are this you kind know, of Wolf of Wall Street character, that they're so charismatic and intelligent, careful, effective and successful. They always rise to the top of a company. And while, yes, there are a lot of CEOs and upper management that seem to have psychopathic traits, and we'll talk about that, there are a lot of psychopaths that are not successful, that, that fail, that crash and burn. And, and there are reasons for that. There are elements of what we consider psychopathy that, that tend to engage in high-risk, high-reward stuff where you either wind up as the CEO or you wind up unemployed. So in this video, we're going to talk about what a psychopath is. We're going to talk about how you assess and identify psychopathy in, a, in an individual. We'll talk about potentially some of the theories about what might cause it, and a few other kind of common questions about the condition. So first off, what is it? The answer is, it's not entirely clear, to be honest. It's not something that's in the DSM. It's not uh, an established official uh, diagnosis in that sense. It's usually considered as something that's under the larger umbrella of antisocial personality disorder. This is a much broader condition that is in the DSM, and it includes everything from you know, kids that have gotten involved in the wrong crowd to lifelong career criminals. And this is a very broad category here. Psychopaths tend to be a, a, a kind of a, a sliver of this demographic. And you could poll three or four different psychologists that are experts in this field and ask them to list the traits of psychopathy, and they might not entirely agree. And there are different models and theories about it specifically and exactly what psychopathy is and, and what the criteria for calling someone a psychopath might be. But when you look at each of these different different conceptualizations of psychopathy that are out there, there, there does seem to be some overlap. And three of these common core traits that, that you tend to find kind of universally in each of the conceptualizations are boldness, disinhibition, and what's called meanness. So first off, boldness. Individuals who are psychopaths tend to not show a ton of fear. They have a high tolerance for stress. They have a high tolerance for unfamiliar situations. They have a high tolerance for danger. They don't seem to have a big fear response and anticipation of danger. Like if you were to get hooked up to a machine and I was gonna tell you that I'm gonna shock you in 10 seconds, as that clock takes down, you're gonna start anticipating that, that punishment, that painful stimulus. You might start sweating, your heart rate might go up, you might breathe more heavily but not psychopaths. They don't tend to have a real visceral response in anticipation of painful stimuli or things that we normally might feel anxiety or fear about. Now you can see where this sort of high risk, high reward behavior might actually benefit somebody in certain industries. So for example, take 10 psychopaths and you put them in the finance industry. 
nine out of those 10 might fail out. They may make big bets on risky decisions and they don't pan out. They go bankrupt, they get fired, whatever. But one, one out of 10, that one guy may just through luck of the draw actually be very successful because of this behavior and therefore be promoted and rise to the top of these organizations. Now, the thought is there's these, these, a theory that kind of gets floated around out there that this may lead to a disproportionately high concentration of people with this kind of behavior, psychopathic tendencies, at high levels of certain corporations and organizations. When those organizations have a large amount of influence over our economy, this could be a problem because they're not very risk averse. They're not afraid of making bad decisions and they're potentially what you might consider a little bit reckless. And that can lead to things like the 2008 financial crisis, where a bunch of high risk, bad investments blew up and took the economy down with them. Now, the second trait is disinhibition. And this is effectively poor impulse control. You have a hard time with behavioral restraint. You have a hard time delaying a, a desire or a need for immediate gratification. And this is kind of what went wrong with that CEO from the case study I mentioned. You go to work every day and there are probably people that get under your skin that you would like to lash out at, but you don't. You are inhibiting that impulse. We don't tend to see a ton of that in psychopaths. Now, every psychopath is a little bit different. Everyone has a different mix of, of, of traits, but in a lot of them, there is uh, a tendency to engage in outbursts or aggressive behavior, antisocial behavior. And it's these traits that led to that increasingly toxic culture in the company that was examined through that case study. The last one is meanness. And, and really, this is oftentimes described as just a lack of empathy uh, or, or a lack of remorse and regret. Psychopaths don't tend to gravitate toward very close relationships. Now, they may develop relationships that the other individual perceives as being close, and they're effectively using that person in a manipulative way to seek power or some kind of a Machiavellian means to an end. And they'll oftentimes be kind of cruel or, or exploit people to get what they want. Now, one thing that's important to know about, about evaluating psychopathy is it's not like a, a cold or a flu where you either have it or you don't. There may not be a real hard cutoff where you go, this is not psychopathic behavior and this is. It's, it's more of a gradual, continuous, almost spectrum of psychopathic tendencies. So for the people that are very clearly high on this psychopathic tendency chart, why? Like, how do they get that way? Is it a bad childhood? Is it something about their genetic code? And the answer is, honestly, we, we don't really fully know. <laughs> there is seems to be a consensus in the field, though, that when it comes to psychopathy, although childhood and experiences, you know, as you go through life might play a role, in large part, this is probably something to do with the fundamental biology of how your brain is wired. And you're probably born this way. So remember when I mentioned this inhibition, right? That this lack of ability to regulate or or control your impulses in, in, in your behavior. The part of your brain that's doing that is, is called the prefrontal cortex, the very front part of your brain here. That's where a lot of self-control comes from. Emotional regulation, behavioral regulation. When we look at individuals that are high in psychopathic traits, they don't tend to have the same levels of functioning in the prefrontal cortex. Now, this difference in activity or, or, or decrease in activity in those those areas suggest that these individuals either may not have a desire to or just may not be capable of inhibiting these behavioral tendencies that we see in psychopathic individuals. Another area that we see differences in, 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 in functioning is the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is an area of your brain that does a lot of different things, but one of the major roles that it plays is anxiety. It's constantly screening the environment for potential threats. In individuals with psychopathy, we don't see the same levels of activity in the amygdala structures. Additionally, there was a study that came out in 2011 that suggested that, that there were fewer connections between uh, two areas of the brain. So one called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And this is a part of the brain that seems to be associated with feelings of empathy and guilt, right? And that it had fewer connections with the amygdala, right? Anxiety and fear. It suggested that there may be something fundamentally different about that entire circuit that controls empathy, guilt, anxiety, and fear. And that lines up with the symptoms that we see in these people behaviorally. And then in 2012, a study came out suggesting that psychopaths show reduced gray matter, so reduced physical brain volume, in an area called the paralimbic system. 
the paralimbic system is involved in, in a few things, but a, but a couple of those are emotion processing and self-control. This was probably present from birth, from early on in development. Another piece of evidence on this pile suggesting that it, it's nature, not nurture, that it's something to do with the way you're born, potentially some sort of inherited genetic thing that makes you likely to exhibit psychopathic tendencies. So the next question is, can we fix this? You know, can we cure psychopathy? And the answer is no. I mean, this is an area of debate. This is an active area of debate. But the overall thought is that it's not curable, uh, but it might be treatable. And and the, the reasoning there is that, you know, what might be driving this stuff is, is, is the topology of your brain. You know, it, it's the way that it's structured and probably from birth. And that's not necessarily going to change anytime soon. But through therapy or, or through some kind of a, a long-term continuous engagement with a, with a structured process and a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you might be able to mitigate and reduce psychopathic behaviors or psychopathic tendencies in an individual. The challenge here is that frequently people who exhibit psychopathic tendencies don't seek help to treat it. They don't want to be treated. They don't think anything's wrong with them. They're okay with who they are. And so they're not really in willfully engaging in whatever treatment regimen might be prescribed to them. Two of the more common approaches uh, are largely ineffective. So number one, traditionally therapy is this talking cure, right? It's this talking approach where you work through things, you have a, you develop a relationship to some degree with your therapist, and that relationship requires a certain level of openness and willingness to engage in the process and a certain level of honesty. You know, if you're lying to your therapist, there's not a whole lot they can do. When someone's a psychopath, then manipulation and deceit is a really big part of that, that personality profile they're probably not going to engage in the process in good faith, and therefore they're probably not going to get a lot out of it. The other approach sometimes to behavioral modification comes from behaviorism, right? Skinner, watching those guys, and it's punishment reward. This is effectively animal training that we apply it to people too. Uh, when you get a speeding ticket, you're being punished. You know, you're, you're being these are these are operant conditioning principles being applied to modify your behavior. The thought is we might be able to apply that to individuals with psychopathy. It's not uncommon to engage in these methods with prison populations, people that are not willfully engaging in behavioral modification programs, but they still will respond to punishment, for example. The problem here, though, is that, again, psychopaths don't tend to be very receptive or responsive to punishment. They don't fear punishment. It's not aversive to them. That's, again, part of the profile. Now, there are a few ideas about potential approaches that might be effective. Some evidence suggests it is effective, some not so much, a little ambiguous right now. These approaches tend to have two things in common. One, they focus more on rewards than punishments. And then two, they tend to be more impactful when the treatment is started at a younger age. So the younger you can find a kid that seems to be exhibiting some of these behavioral symptoms and the, and the earlier you can start this treatment regimen, the better the outcomes are down the road. But even with that, this is not a cure. I mean, this is something where there is a percentage drop in the recidivism, right? the, the chance to go back to jail, juvenile hall, prison, or, or there is a overall decrease in the baseline numbers of, of, of psychopathic or antisocial behaviors they engage in, but you're not rewiring their brain. You're not curing this and removing it from their personality profile. You're just trying to treat it and reduce it and mitigate it to some degree and help that person function on a personal, professional, and just larger social level more so than they would have done without treatment. Now, I want to address a couple of interesting like, myths about psychopathy. Number one, this thought that they're like kind of these brilliant serial killers, right? These, these incredibly high IQ people, very smart. That may not be the case. On average, there doesn't really seem to be a huge difference in the IQ of psychopaths versus non-psychopathic individuals. Uh, just like any other population, there are people that are psychopaths that are very high IQ. And there are people who are psychopathic who are very low IQ and everything in between. Uh, even a few studies have, have shown that maybe on average, there's a lower IQ than the general population. But again, that's one of those things we need more data and, and replications before we kind of said that's a fact. But there really doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence suggesting that there are these evil geniuses running around with exceptionally or abnormally high levels of intelligence. And another question that comes up a lot from students is, is can psychopaths feel empathy? Do they feel regret and remorse? Classically, the thought has been no, they don't feel empathy and regret. 
but there's been some interesting research recently that has suggested that psychopaths probably can feel regret, for example. The catch is they do not use that information to influence and inform their decision making. So they may feel regret after a behavior they engage in, but it, they're going to keep doing it, right? They're not going to stop doing something because they feel bad about something. They're not going to fail to do something because it might make somebody else feel bad. They're aware of that possibility. They're not blind to it. They just don't use that to decide which course of action is the correct option. And the last thing I want to touch on is, are there certain professions that tend to have higher levels of, of psychopathy, a higher proportion of people that exhibit psychopathic traits? Now, this is a question that does not have a ton of research on it, and there is some. It's not by any means definitive, but there is one study that gets referenced a lot. It's a, it's a study that in, involved 5,400 subjects that were sent questionnaires. And it did claim to find uh, clusters of professions that had particularly high levels of psychopaths present in them. So number 10 was civil servant. Number nine was chef. Number eight, police officers. Seven, priests. Six, journalists. Five would be surgeons. And I don't know, you're cutting into human flesh all day, maybe a, a slight dip in um, empathic response might be beneficial. Uh, then above that is salesperson and then radio and television personalities. The top two. Number two is lawyers. And again, think about the industry. Think about the requirements of the profession. If you're a lawyer, you may be forced to construct elaborate and passionate defenses of individuals that morally are not great people. So you can see where potentially some of these traits might be beneficial in that industry. Uh, and the number one across the board, CEO. So yeah, maybe some stereotypes are true. So I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for watching this video if you're still watching at this point. If you have any questions about psychopathy, sociopathy, antisocial personality disorder, any of the, the cluster of symptoms here, uh, leave a comment and I, I will absolutely go through, answer them the best I can, uh, and have an excellent rest of your day.